Hey, hello, this is Guillaume Chevalier for a talk about growing neat software architecture from Jupyter Notebooks. So first things first, what are Jupyter Notebooks? Well, here's a simple example where someone in Python might just do a few things such as importing something, printing something, taking R a random number between 0 and 1, and then doing things with this number such as printing it, printing it squared. Then we can see that we can execute cells in a certain order that we choose, uh, which will add a number with the order of execution of the cell to the left of the cell. And so this is a Jupyter notebook. It's like a browser uh, it's an IDE in your browser that you can uh, run from uh, launching the Jupyter Notebook command and in which you will have some uh, notebooks that will be saved to disks. And so here what, what, what it allows us to do is that you can take some values and then continue to code uh, at the same time that you've got some execution flow set up. So here you can take some R, do a few things with it and change things, add code, remove code and then take a new R and do those things again or something. So you can, you can mix up the flow of execution and you can continue the execution of what you've just coded. So what's interesting with that is that you can kind of debug as you code. So you can see what's going on while you code, which is a great plus. So why use notebooks? Well, beginners might only use main files or something. Then intermediate coders and, and good coders might do TDD and they might also use the debugger. But there's this joke about the guru level where you can debug uh, as you code uh, w by using a notebook. So uh, with notebooks, it's really good that you can uh, really see what's going on at the same time that you code. So. Uh, think about the test-driven development, the TDD loop. So uh, I will explain it uh, for the people that doesn't know what it is. But, but uh, what it happen what's happening here is that when you use a notebook, it's like doing small iterations uh, of the TDD loop uh, really, really quickly in a really constrained fashion. Because how test-driven development works is that you first write a test, for instance, a unit test or an accept an acceptance test, then you write code to make the test pass, and then afterwards you refactor the code to make it clean before actually moving on with writing another test for your goal uh, of, of coding. So when you code using a notebook like that, well, it's like if you, you were doing tests. So let's see how to write a test first. So you first arrange the test. So you might load some data or create it, in fact, and then you then in second you will act. So you will actually call a function or something to to do the actual work you want to test. And then at the third uh, step of writing a test, you will assert. Uh, so you will you will ensure that what you've received as an output from the act part is as you expect. So this is called the triple A's of test-driven development. So you arrange the test, you can act, and you can assert. So when all your test passes in a project, this is a good sign that your project is healthy and that there should be no big bug in your project. So here, when you think about it, uh, it's like if you were doing a test. So you set up a few things, you, you, you act on it, and then you you print things, you, you inspect what you've received. So you might want here to assert that your value R is between zero and one. So notebooks can make your life simpler and make things faster. So it's good, but up to which point? Well, everything's going to be right when you code in notebooks until the point that it, uh, it will end up too messy. So what happens is that when you code like that, your tests aren't extracted. You print things, you test things, you, you've you made it, you've almost made the test, but you haven't taken the text out of your, your notebook. And you've also skipped your refactoring part. So 
your code will end up dirty. It will result in a fast coding speed, but everything will be right until you realize you have no test coverage for your code, you realize that your code is dirty, and that you realize that you've badly copy-pasted your notebook many times to like increment the version or something and that's dirty and you should not do that. So your TDD loop was sacrificed and you end up with a mess. How to do proper TDD with notebooks? So just know that here I will suggest a way to, to work with that. Uh, I think I've heard of some some plugin that allows you to, to really do TDD with notebooks or something. Uh, but here's here's how you, you can do it with vanilla Jupyter notebooks. Uh, just as they're just as they come from from like the the original thing. So you already have your triple A's. You arranged something, you acted on it, and, and you, you did prints and things and charts instead of asserting actually. So when you act when using notebooks, you're probably doing research and development or sure, um, of some kind. So you're probably coding some weird algorithm or uh, some, kind of, some kind of special machine learning model. And uh, well, it, it can, things, can be, can, th things can be hard with that. So how to do this properly? So you will need to think about extracting your algorithm to a proper abstraction so you might do a function a class uh, many classes and functions something and and extract your code like that and put put it into external files in your software architecture so you're, by architecture i mean uh, the way your modules interact within each other's the way files import each other's and the way you structured all that into folders and subfolders in your project for instance so Extract your things and also think about actually writing your test and extracting it too to your test suite. So you will be able to run tests after and to ensure that good, there's th your code still works. So when your code still works, uh, it's, it's good. Well, you want to have a test suite to, to be able to see if your things work when you do changes. So afterwards, then, when you've done those two things, uh, don't forget to, to often uh, clean your things, refactor, reorganize your module and your code base and, and things. So in practice, uh, Jupyter notebooks can be very, very messy if uh, you've not been warned as I'm, as I'm warning you today. So first you might end up with bad version control. I've seen so many projects uh, where Notebooks were just copy pasted and improved upon uh, with some v1, v2, v3, v20, and then uh, things end up messy. So when you copy notebook like like that, uh, things get worse if you didn't extract your methods and your things to your actual software architecture because you will end up duplicating more code by duplicating your notebooks. And trust me, you'll be really tempted to uh, to copy paste your notebooks like that to version them, because first, uh, notebooks are saved on disk like some kind of JSON. So when you use that with Git to do your version control, then it's kind of messy and it's not quite clean. And when you see the diff, it's bad. And and because you're probably doing some research or something, uh, you'll just want to try something out, but keep. Uh, a sort of checkpoint of where you were before adding some new changes in kind in case you want to revert so this version control thing can can get uh, really messy in a research project so I've been there I've done that uh, I've done more than 30 machine learning projects in which more than half of those projects or maybe two-thirds of those projects uh, I've used notebooks at some point, at the beginning of the project especially, or, or sometimes at, at some point. So I've done the mistakes above, uh, the mistakes I have, I've talked to you about, and I regret uh, not having heard of, of, of really keeping the notebooks clean. And even experienced programmers, I mean, if, if you know TDD, if you know everything that you need to know to, to do some good code, uh, when you will use notebooks at some point to gain some speed, you will do a few things in a messy way and you will regret 
if you've not been warned so i'm here to do that right now uh, so there's a way to do it uh, properly and, and and still use notebooks because notebooks are good it can make things easier uh, it's just that they must be used correctly so after doing my mistakes I, I've been uh, realizing in a few uh, enterprises that this is a very typical mistake to do bad version control and to end up with some very 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 poor code that gets unmaintainable and that is really uh, unfortunately kind of rotten so uh, hopefully when I'm here uh, uh, I tell people to do this a better way so what's a good usage of notebooks well there are a lot <laughs> so first some throwaway code uh, something you just want to test out and that you might not reuse or something uh, this is a good usage of notebook you want to code something very dirty very quickly and then see what it gives and, and then just maybe throw it and when you're doing research and development, R&D, uh, especially scientific research and experimental development, uh, when you do experimental development, then the, the ED in, in SR and ED uh, is, is where you might really want to use notebooks because you're doing experimental things that you might throw away. Then when you do visualizations and charts, then using notebooks is a very good thing because yes, you can do charts in notebooks and add text and add a, uh, some animations and things. There are some plugins as well you can use. Notebooks are really good to make demos and tutorials. Very, very good. And also documentation pages. I'll show you later. You can as well do your EDA with notebooks, the exploratory data analysis. So let's say you're working on a new machine learning project and you've got some data you want to analyze and use then uh, with this data uh, you will want to see how you load it and it will be cool to do that in a notebook and then doing some charts of the data and some visualizations and just inspecting the data feeling it a, a little bit more to be able to 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 guess what, what will be the, the best model to use on this data and you can do also your feature engineering uh, here so, so you will you will want to create some features out of your data to improve it and and making it more uh, readable by your machine learning model for instance a, a, a deep neural network then you will want to analyze your results with notebooks as I'll show you later and notebooks can be good too when you want to code uh, the actual models because when you're not using notebooks you need to write unit tests right or at least load things from a mine a main file so when you do that then if your model takes days to train or hours then it's really bad that you already need to to code all of the serialization code in advance especially if you're doing research and you're not sure if you will keep this in production later or something you want to just go fast so when you're using a notebook you can just load things, train the model, have it in memory, and then query the model and, and inspect the results and analyze the predictions and things like that. And, and this is a good use case for notebooks here. Although I still recommend to do the refactors and to extract your things to some classes that are external to your Jupyter notebook. Uh, this can be a good way to work, to just debug things and, and test things. So yeah, let's see a few usages uh, of notebooks that uh, I've done in the past, for instance. So here's a tutorial. Uh, it's one of my biggest tutorials, or 2,500 stars. Uh, this, has made, uh, this has made it on the first page of the Acker News at some point, and it was a, a really big project back then, uh, some four years ago. So this project is about using recurrent neural network to scan the activity of some people from accelerometer data and from gyroscope data so people might be walking standing laying things like that and here you'll want to use a recurrent neural network to uh, actually uh, do the processing so in, so in this project it's a many to one there are a few uh, sensor readings that are analyzed to generate a prediction which is the category uh, we see so this notebook is quite interesting if you want to read it but you, you can see that we can add charts 
you know you can import matplotlib and do some inline plots which is resulting in this kind of things uh, and you can view things and analyze things and things like that so another project example is here uh, another recurrent neural network uh, tutorial I've made um, more maybe more like an exercise uh, this one has almost uh, 800 stars and uh, it's a series of four exercises so first one is easy you have some values progressing through time from left to right in blue here and when you are at the present moment here you want to forecast the future of those values and you can do predictions in, in yellow and you, you, you want to compare that to the actual real values in 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 blue so this is this one is easy it's a sinus and a cosinus uh, here in exercise 2 you have like a mix of some uh, frequencies and exercise 3 you can have uh, that but with with some noise inside it so it's really cool it's a way to to use uh, deep learning and recurrent neural networks to scan past data and generate a, a cool forecast so same concept as as the previous tutorial here a time series are uh, readings from sensors from the past up to the present and in the present you'll want to classify six activities so by the way if you want to learn more on deep learning and on recurrent neural networks i have a really good training on that uh, which is also a fast-paced training which is rich in content so uh, if that's in if, if, if you like that uh, to learn how it works then you'll want to check out uh, in the description of the the video the youtube video uh, below here uh, to be able to uh, get this training so another example of usage of jupyter notebook is in another of my project here where i have done automatic machine learning which is a way to train many uh, artificial neural networks and to try different hyperparameters on them so it's like a, a genetic algorithm you know you try many configurations for uh, some kind of object or or thing and you want to choose the best one so here is what I've done here and here are some results and analyzing the results with charts here is very good so I had like the hyperparameter space and uh, I got some charts here so for instance here is one parameter which was the number of layers of neurons in the artificial neural network and I had either two or three here and we can see in, in blue and in, in red the, the two or the three uh, same things for other parameters where the layers stacked as resi residual layers and you, you get true or false and things like that you know it was a big hyperparameter search and it's also possible to do some other charts to to see the correlations uh, between different hyperparameters uh, with respect to the score that was obtained to get some insight on what's going on here have another tutorial just quickly here this one is interesting it's a let me find the uh, oh yeah so here is it's, it's just a, a way to build a machine learning pipeline that consists of first the removal of some, of some stop words such as d that is uh, in a text then stemming the words to get like the the root of the word uh, to make them shorter and combine some words into the same and then a count vectorizer will take all of those words and vectorize them into a dictionary vector with counts uh, and then you can apply some machine learning algorithm on top of that such as LDA, LDA here uh, which is a way to extract topics out of the text so this is a cool project I've done for a client and it's open source so you might want to check it out to to learn how to use pipelines then uh, here is another usage of a notebook it's actually in the documentation of Neuraxel my open source machine learning library for doing uh, pipelines and for doing uh, automatic machine learning so here are some random distributions and you can uh, see them here so it's just a visualization here's a uniform here's a log uniform uh, and things like that you have normals log normal and things that are commonly used for hyperparameters 
So this can be highly useful uh, for machine learning projects. And by the way, thank you, uh, Eric Amel, for uh, having written this tutorial for uh, the open source library Neraxel. Now, getting into software architecture. This is getting cool. So when you will extract your files, uh, your functions and things to some modules, you want to have cohesion between your files and modules. So should belong to the same module, uh, the classes that are used only by other classes of that same module, classes that change together and that are used together. So let's say you have an algorithm that is uh, consisting of a lot of small functions and things like that, then you might want to put them all inside the same folder, but you won't necessarily put inside that same folder of code, uh, the code that you had for loading the data at the beginning. So you want to keep that separate, for instance. Now that's about coupling now. Uh, you want to uh, really be careful about the coupling of your objects and of your functions in your code because your modules should have no circular imports and you should depend towards the most stable abstractions. This is very important. So in a machine learning project, what's the most stable abstraction? It's probably your artificial neural network and maybe also perhaps your automatic machine learning loop to just find it again in case you change the data or something. Things like that. And your data might change often or or you know you might apply your deep learning algorithm on some more new data and uh, well you'll want to make it reusable so you don't want your algorithm to depend on the disks and on the data and you don't want to uh, your algorithm to be fetching the data inside it uh, you want to first load your data and send it to, a, to the algorithm so that the algorithm can receive any data so this is called dependency inversion or injection yeah you can inject the data in your algorithm instead of just calling your algorithm and letting him loading the data this is a very important uh, thing to keep in mind uh, which is also related to the tell don't ask use uh, tell don't ask uh, kind of principle and uh, the law of Demeter uh, so uh, thank you by the way Robert C Martin the author of Clean Code, for having come up and explaining tools, uh, really useful concepts. And also to Martin Fowler, uh, who has a lot of content on the, on the, the tell don't ask. Uh, so also, you, you, will, you will want to have more abstractions uh, the more you have stability. So the more something is stable, the more ab abstract it is, right? So if you have uh, something to do machine learning, then it m you might have some automatic machine learning and some pipelines and combining some pipeline steps to pre-process the data and then process the data and then do a prediction and then post-process the data or something. So this pipeline will have lots of abstractions and things and hopefully it will be stable. The kind of software architectures that I like is the layered software architecture. So you might have an API layer and also an application service layer, domain and infrastructure and persistence layer. So your neural network and the automatic machine learning loop would be in the domain. This is something stable, this is something you want to import from the other layers and not the other way around. Your domain shouldn't change too often. So for instance, you might change your data later or you might apply your same machine learning algorithm to another business use case later that is completely different from the first one but that reuses the same technology, uh, technological core or something. So the domain should be really stable. So uh, this is like your, your core uh, programming code here. This is the most fun part. Around the domain there is the infrastructure and persistence and the application service. So infrastructure and persistence uh, its job is to load the data, right? So you might have an abstract class, so some kind of interface to get the data and set it or something like that. So you might have a version of your um, of your persistence uh, 
uh, code here that uses disks so you can load data from disks uh, at the early part of your project in your testing code you might as well want to be able to read and write the data from just just your memory not not even using disks for writing some uh, ephemeral tests that will just for which the data will just go away after and you won't save it it's not saved on disk for instance and when you you will release your algorithm in production for real work then you might want to connect to a database instead of using disks so uh, here uh, it is the good uh, layer for that it can allow different methods all through the same interface so you have here the application service layer which is role is to use uh, and load the data and to send it to your algorithm in the domain so the domain should receive any kind of different it can re receive data from different data sources and it doesn't care it's not like if your application was calling your domain objects and then that they were calling the databases or, or something it's more that your service uh, retrieved a good way to load the data and can pass that abstraction to the domain if needed or just load it and then pass it to the domain which is even less direct so there's also your API layer you might want to use a command line to interact with your program or a REST web API or something else uh, like a graphical user interface something I don't know then you want an API layer here to be able to uh, make this this interface to your your program such that other software or people can interact with it so with that then uh, this is the way to layer things and it's it's logical you know uh, here uh, the application service imports your data and your domain uh, and the domain doesn't import the data there's kind of this inversion here and then after that the, uh, the API imports the application service only to be able to do small function calls here that represents the whole application so everything you can do with the application is in the application service and the API doesn't have to dig into the other layers for instance so here's an example uh, of how uh, I can structure that in a machine learning project so uh, you might want to do here uh, the layers and also have some main files to first run the automatic machine learning loop and then after that's run and where you've saved your best model in the cache folder then you might want to do some REST API serving of the best model to to be able to, to give predictions and depending on when you code things locally versus in the cloud for a production project then the the infrastructure layer might be different so your automatic machine learning loop and your REST API serving thing might have used a different context here to load a different infrastructure and persistence uh, uh, location so here I was using the local cache folder and local data folder for instance and local plus fol folder as, as well so here if we zoom in to the left uh, we have the API which has the REST package uh, the application service has everything it needs and also notice that there's a context here below uh, and in this context we can choose what to send to the application service uh, so it will use the different things you have in the infrastructure and code things and depending on which context you use whether it is a testing context or a local context on your computer or a production context in the cloud with a database then it can register the, the different things you have in your infrastructure depending on this context and register them in the service locator for your service to be able to retrieve the good things after so this is like a singleton design pattern by the way I really like this way of coding which is also uh, teached by Elabs Technologies a consulting firm in Quebec here so then the domain you might have your automatic machine learning loop as well as your machine learning pipeline which may be so you might have a first pipeline for pre-processing the data and then another pipeline for doing the random search or your other automatic machine learning algorithm and then also your your main machine learning pipelines which might use some steps inside it so I really like this way of coding and uh, 
By the way, if you want to learn more on the actual way I build pipelines using steps, uh, such as for instance, when I was here uh, doing a pipeline and chaining steps together, this I think the pipeline uh, design pattern is really the best one. So you can use scikit-learn or Nerexo to do that. Uh, Nerexo is more recent, I've built it uh, less than a year ago and uh, scikit-learn exists since something like uh, 2007 it was like in a pre-deep learning era or something so um, there were some features that, that were lacking uh, such as the ability to loop over some MIDI batches for your pipeline steps or or to do some kind of uh, things like that or yeah uh, so if you want to learn more on how I structure my machine learning projects but in, in the in terms of design patterns uh, as well as of the architecture of the projects then uh, check out the description, uh, the links in the description of this video uh, to be able to access this content. So thank you for listening to me. And by the way, you can connect with me uh, on LinkedIn. So uh, you can search for me, Guillaume Chevalier. And uh, you can also uh, connect with my business, Neuraxio Inc. So uh, here are the links for reaching out so uh, on my github you know chevalier Nerexio, on twitter on linkedin on facebook and there's also my personal blog here and uh, my company's website so thank you for listening to me and to check out the course on clean machine learning uh, see the description of this video and also uh, you can find my other course on deep neural networks and recurrent neural networks if you want to learn how to apply that to some use cases where you want, you might want to process time series data. So uh, thank you very much.